Amen. Ephesians chapter 1. Everybody get your Bibles out, please. And uh, we'll pick up where we left off our last week. Recap just a tad. And uh, pick it up there. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I don't want to drag this study, but I don't want to skip over some of these things that are very important tonight. Uh, briefly, if you laid out last Wednesday night, uh, or if you had to work or something happened, you couldn't come. Uh, the book of Ephesians has six chapters. It's written about 62 A.D. by the Apostle Paul himself. The epistle means letter. When somebody says the epistle, that means letter. That's what that word means. And uh, it's written to the church, the body of Christ. And it's very important when you study your Bible to know who's talking, who they're talking to, and what conditions are they talking in. Like, uh, like to the church is way different than to Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, that's why the Seventh-day Adventists get so confused. Uh, they were saying, well, see there? God said keep the Sabbath. God said keep the Sabbath. And they're confused. They're confused. And the reason they are is because they don't rightly divide the word of truth. They think we're under, we're Jews in the Old Testament. And the Bible says the Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel. He don't say that about any other of the nine commandments. Just that one. That one commandment was a sign between Christ, uh, or between God and Israel. You say, well, what's our Sabbath now? Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. He's our rest. And in him we rest. Now we go to church seven days a week. One guy told me one time, he said, I can't believe y'all go, you, that's blasphemy. You go to church on Saturday, on Sunday. I said, well, I go Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's two. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. So we, we talked a little bit about an apostle. We talked a little bit about um, Ephesus, the, the city. We talked a little bit about the uh, heavenly places there in verse 3. That's a great little study there. And then, blam, we hit a, we hit a nine-foot-tall, mile-high roadblock called predestination. And that is in verse number 4. And we hit the doctrine of Calvinism. John Calvin was a bright and shining light in his day. He did do some good things and taught some good things. But he was a confused man when he came. He believed in sprinkling babies. Uh, and he, uh, 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 some true Calvinists uh, believe that babies go to hell if they're not elect. And the only other alternative to that, in believing that, is that all babies who die are the elect. So if all babies who die aren't elect, some of them go to hell. And, uh, and that's, that is a very, very evil, wicked, uh, blasphemous thing to try to blame on God. And so tonight, we'll, we'll hit that a little bit more tonight. And, and we got it in verse number four. The Bible said, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, now, make sure you see them two words, in Him. You were chosen in Him. You were not in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now, the way that's worded, I can see how a person could misunderstand it. Don't say we were in Christ at the It said God chose to save us before the foundation of the world. In Christ. That's what it says. It don't say God looked around one day and he said, I'm going to make a world. And I'm going to make nine billion people total. And I'm going to, I'm going to send eight billion of them to hell and I'm going to save a billion of them and take them to heaven. That's what they believe. And that's not true. That's not true. Uh, God, they believe God has to will for you because you cannot even will to be saved. Like whosoever will, that's how you get saved. Whosoever will, you will to get saved. Then God does the saving. They say a dead man can't do that. And that's not true. That's not true. You're only dead spiritually. You are not dead physically. And, uh, and you're alive and you have a mind you think. And you come to the Lord, he quickens you. And you're, you're saved. You're, you believe on him and he quickens you. A Calvinist teaches that you're quickened before you believe. So you're actually made alive from the dead before you even believe. They say, because you can't believe until you're quickened. And that's backwards. 
Arthur W. Pink it was taught systematic, by systematic theology. And uh, all them guys, I believe that John MacArthur, very well-known preacher now, who has some good teachings on some stuff. He's mixed up on the Bible, and he's definitely mixed up in this doctrine of election and predestination. Uh, if, you were, if you were in Christ, foundation of the world, you were never without hope. You never were without hope. You had hope. You, 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 you say, well, we was in Christ before the foundation of the world. Well, how come it said, but when we were without hope? If you was in Christ, you wasn't without hope. You know what they believe? You had hope, you just didn't know it. And that ain't right. That ain't right. You were without hope before you got saved. You know when God, you know when you got in Christ? When you got saved. The Lord put you in the body of Christ. Now, uh, uh, saying that, and you can always tell a false doctrine because they will add words to a verse to make it teach what they want it to say. For example, the Lord, we would say, well, uh, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, but is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. They will say, well, that means all the elect. See how you had to add that word in there to make it teach you doctrine? If you have to add a word to a verse of scripture to make it teach your belief, something's wrong with your belief. That's right. Don't ever forget that. That's one of the most important things you'll ever learn about studying the Bible. Watch out. Watch them. Watch, watch every cult, every false doctrine. Put words in a verse that ain't there. Take a verse word out of the verse that is there or take the verse out of the context to teach what they believe. It didn't say he's not willing that any should per any of the elect should perish. It said any. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, what, you know what they believe? God so loved the elect world. Those that were elected. That's what it really means. Because if God loved everybody and some of them went to hell, that means his death was waste. He didn't, he didn't accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. Somehow like he failed or something like that. And uh, that's baloney. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4, we say, who will say, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, no, no, that, that's right. So in summation, and we're not going to take all our time on this. I want to get to the more practical stuff in Ephesians that will help you in your everyday life, taking the kids to school, raising a family, in your marriage, stuff like that. That's what you need. Uh, but we, we got to get these doctrines. you got to get them straight because some nut will try to get you confused if you ain't careful. So in summation, election always based upon foreknowledge. Every time. Jacob and Esau, God knew ahead of time what they was going to do. Pharaoh, God knew ahead of time. There are two favorite examples. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. God didn't decide to love Jacob and hate Esau just because he's wanting to be arbitrarily decide what he's going to do. He knew what them boys was going to do. And then he said, in time, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Uh, it's based on foreknowledge. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's see here. Uh, look at verse 5. Having predestinated who? Us. People that are saved. Not lost people. He didn't predestinate you to get in Christ. He predestinated us that are saved to be in the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, this thing about adoption, uh, people say, well, you're, you're not even adopted physically yet. You have a spiritual adoption. When you get saved, you have a spiritual adoption. This old body, we wait for the redemption of our body. When we, get, when we die, or the, Lord come, or the Lord comes back actually, we get a new body. And the Bible said in Romans, to wit the redemption of our body. We wait for that. One day our body will be born again. Right now, just our spirit. We're born again of the spirit. This flesh is no different than it was when I got saved. Just older and uglier. That's the only difference. And, you're, and scars and stuff like that. Your flesh don't change when you get saved. It's your, You're born again of the spirit. If you get your fingers cut off out in a knife fight in a bar somewhere... And then you get saved the next month. Guess what? You don't grow a new finger. That flesh stays the same. It stays the same until it's born again at the rapture and you get a new body. So, 
I'll give you one, Matthew 23, 37. You don't have to turn to it for time's sake. Jesus told them Jews one time, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen doth her, her, her chicks, and you would not. He said, I would, you would not. I wanted to gather you, but you wouldn't. That's, it's not irresistible grace. That's the letter TULIP. You know, I went over that with you last week. T, total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. P, perseverance of the saints. That's what a Calvinist, a TULIP. And they call them hyper-Calvinists when they really, really, really go. And that stuff is sweeping through the Southern Baptist churches like a wildfire. Uh, there, there's thousands and thousands of preachers. Uh, but I, I tell you what, I tell you what, I, you y'all know me. I mean, you people here know me. You can I, most of y'all you can read my face. I I see some of y'all looking at me sometimes to see what I'm thinking about so, something, and, and you say I don't see what, and you can tell it. I, I, it's hard for me to hide, man. Uh, and uh, you you can and you you know what? If I really believed, if I really believed that everybody that's going to be saved is going to be saved, and ain't nothing nobody can do about it, the first thing I'd do is sell them buses. For the first person that come along had the money, and then I drop all of our missionary support, and then I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever fast. Why fast? What for? We're all going. Everybody's going to heaven. Going anyway. Well, I can't verse over in Timothy that they said he used that. Um, I'll, I'll pray that the elect may obtain the salvation with eternal glory, because the elect's going to be saved. They're going to get it no matter if you pray or not. Not willing that any should perish. Not willing. If that just means the elect, y'all, it don't matter if he's willing or not, they ain't going to perish. So I would do that. And then, I, I don't know what I'd do. What do you do? I'd feed the sheep. That's what they say you're supposed to do. Don't waste your time on them goats. Just feed the sheep. I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd go get me an honest job making an honest living. If I believed... But every, I, I preached revival one time and I had a deacon at this church and uh, he said, you shouldn't even went and preach that revival. And I said, well, them 11 people got saved last week don't wish that. 11 people got saved. He said, they'd have got saved anyway. I thought right then, there's why you won't go on visitation. Because you believe they're going to get saved anyway. If they are, heck with that. I ain't going to go on visitation. I ain't going to go out there and, and take a chance of getting cussed out beat my knuckles on people's door and waste my Saturday morning if they're all going to get saved anyway. I, listen, you say, well, it don't depend on us. Well, he commanded us. Why did he tell, say send missionaries all over the world? You know what a man told me one time? He said, uh, anybody that ain't never heard the gospel will automatically go to heaven. That's what he said. You'd be surprised if people believe that. If anybody's never heard the gospel, they'll automatically go to heaven. Well, here's the way my mind thinks. If that's true, the best thing to do is not send no missionaries and don't tell them. So they'll all get saved. <laughs> right? If, why did he say go tell them? If they're, not go, if they're all going to heaven without knowing, don't tell nobody. Don't tell your kids. That's logic. And uh, it, it, it's, it's not logical. It's illogical. Uh, you are not predestinated before you get in Christ. The second you get in Christ... You are predestinated to become exactly like Jesus Christ and conform to his image. You are not preordained to get in him. God preordained to save everybody who trusts him and gets in him. I'll give you one. Uh, they like to quote this. A Calvinist likes to say, well, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. How many, how many ever heard that? You didn't choose him, he chose you. And they say, see there, you had nothing to do with it. You chose you, but I remind you, dear friend, that Jesus, when he said that, he is talking to his disciples that they were going out and doing a ministry. And guess who was in that group? Judas. Was Judas chosen? Not to go to heaven, he wasn't. He chose him to be in a ministry. Man told me one time, he said, well, well, Judas was either saved or God called a lost man to preach. And I said, well, God called a lost man to preach. So he wasn't saved. He was a devil. He was a devil. 
before the devil got in him. Judas was a different kind of feller than all them other ones. So Judas was in that crowd. and He said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Say, oh, he chose us to go to heaven. Well, he, did he choose Judas to go to heaven? Did he lose it? Well, no. He didn't have it. Now, uh, justified. Oh, I mean, in Romans 8, 29, they say, whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. See how that's putting all that in the past? He glorified them. That ain't, that ain't happened yet. He, them he also glorified. That's speaking future. But God does that. If you'll notice, the Lord does that a lot sometimes in the Bible. He'll say something like it's already happened, but it, but it ain't happened. Because God's out here looking from eternity. We're down here in time. Them he also justified. Them he also glorified. Well, it ain't happened yet. But in his mind it has. In his mind, he done sees us over our shouting when it's all over. So uh, that's what that verse in Romans 8, 29 means. Uh, uh, so long story short, uh, Calvinism is a heresy. It's a heresy. And it will cool or kill any desire you have for soul winning. Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached 20% on election and, and grace and that's because he didn't understand it right. Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher. 80% of his sermons, the ones he built that church on, were evangelistic sermons like any other evangelistic preacher. Them 20% that were Calvinistic didn't have his church. That's why all of, I, I listened to I, I put one on. I said, I'm just going to give him a fair shot and listen to him. I put one on my phone. Lord have mercy. That's the deadest thing. It was deader than dry crackers, buddy. I mean, it was pitiful. And the, the church is like that. If, if it's what's meant to be, it's meant to be. That kills your life right there. I said there's two Presbyterian preachers walking down the road, you know. They meant everything that happened was meant to be. And one of them tripped like I broke his ankle and said, Phew, I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> well, the, the truth was that wasn't meant to be. You just wasn't watching where you were going. Uh, we're not robots. We're not robots. We don't like, well, God, I've heard him, I've heard Christians a lot of times say, well, if it's meant to be, God, well, a lot of things ain't meant to be, but we fool around and let them happen. God never intended for them to happen. Amen? Don't blame it all on God because bad stuff happened. It's us. We the problem. <laughs> so that, we're going to move on tonight and not get hung up on that. Look at verse number six. Verse number six. Quickly, for just a few minutes. Uh, and we'll, I was wanting to finish this chapter tonight, but we'll never get it done. Uh, but we'll move quicklier, quicklier, more quickly, more quickly after tonight. Uh, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I preached a sermon on that a few years ago. I don't know if y'all got it or not. Maybe I should bring that out and do it again. Everybody's always talking about being accepted. I don't feel accepted. I was there and I didn't feel accepted. I went there and I didn't feel accepted. My family reunion, I didn't feel accepted. Everybody's hung up on that now. You want me to tell you how to be accepted? Get in the beloved. Get right with God. He has made us to be accepted in the beloved. Your family may not accept you, but he will. Amen? Uh, the, 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 a different race uh, will go to another race. Like a white person go to a black church. A black person go to a white church. I didn't feel accepted. It really don't matter. Now, you should, but it don't matter as long as the Lord's accepted you. Hey, I've been a lot of places where I didn't feel accepted. <laughs> Haven't you? I've been a lot of places. Good night, man. I've walked in the state camp back, back 15, or, well, what years ago, before all my girls were gone, Carrie wasn't married at that time. Then Chris and Corey were teenagers. We'd walk in a restaurant after church, and I can see people pointing. And do like that, and I, and I just I just go right like this, walk through there, and say, "Hey, how you doing?" Oh, you know, like it didn't bother me, but it did bother me. I don't want, I don't want people to think bad of me, but you know what? One woman, I don't know where she went to church, but she said she waited till I got right there, and she said blah blah blah, and made it loud so I could hear it. And I said, "Can I have your bill? I'll pay that for you." No, I didn't. I, I should have, should have. That's what I should have done, but I didn't think about it. Uh, that's right, buddy. Amen. Uh, uh, one one time I was over here giving out tracks right there in Morgan, and, and I offered this guy a track. He said, you the one that needs that, Danny. I said, well, Lord bless you there, brother. I do need it. I do need it. I need all the help I can get. 
Boy, it just makes people feel awful when you answer them like that. Amen. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you some stories, Lord have mercy. Good night in the morning. But uh, anyway, I'm glad he made us accept it. Now look at verse 7, one of the greatest verses in the book of Ephesians and one of the greatest verses in the New Testament. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Not through the church membership, not through doing good stuff, not through helping your neighbor, being good to your family, through his blood. Even, or, or the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now people, that redemption through his blood is a great theme in the Bible. Glory to God. I want to sing that song a while ago. When I see the blood, I pass. I will pass over you. When I see the blood, that's what the Lord's looking for, blood. When he, the death angel came through Egypt that night, he came to that. He wasn't looking for nice houses and, and old dumpy trailers. He came through Egypt with that thing that night. You know, we always picture him there coming through there with a sigh, going to kill everybody. And he wasn't looking for uh, rich people and poor people. He wasn't rich, looking for black people, white people, or brown people. He wasn't looking for Israelites. He was looking for blood. He was looking for the blood. If one of them Egyptian had been in the home of one of them Israelites spending the night, brother, they'd have got spared because of the blood. There's protection underneath that blood. That's a picture. That's a picture, brother. That's a picture of our salvation. When the Lord looks down here tonight, he don't look and say, there's a Baptist, there's a Methodist, there's a good man, there's a bad man, there's a sorry person, there's a real dedicated Christian, there's a sorry one. He sees one thing, the blood. And I tell you what you better do. You better thank God for that every day of your life. Because, but I'm telling you what, we are sorry, good for nothings. Amen. Amen. No, y'all ain't fooling me. You made that same stuff. I, I know how wicked you are. That old flesh is rotten as it can be. And I'm telling you, brother, by the time you think it got, you got it whipped, you'll have some evil, ungodly dream or thought or something come. You think, Lord, have mercy. I thought I was right with God. That's your flesh. That's that old seed of sin inside every one of us. And you better thank God for the blood. You're redeemed by the blood. Redemption. And, and the blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament, all it did was hid their sin. The blood of bulls and goats didn't take away sin. It is not possible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. That's why they had to keep doing it over and over and over and over. I priest went in there once a year and put the blood on the altar. All right, that covered us from that last year, Lord. That covered us from last year, Lord. Now when Jesus... That's why they didn't go to heaven when they died. They went to Abraham's bosom. With the exception of, of uh, Enoch and Elijah and possibly Moses, uh, made, God made some kind of exception. All those Old Testament saints didn't go to heaven. The blood hadn't been shed for them yet. They couldn't get in. Their sins were not gone. They were covered like this. It is not, listen to these verses. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Then John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming down the river that night, that day, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that what? Taketh away the sin of the world. But bulls and goats can't do it. There's one to take them away. And the blood of Jesus took them away. Hallelujah. All right, let's go on quickly tonight. Verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded to us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. See, it's a mystery. The world can't understand it. According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, I've got to stop right there. These last two or three verses I've read, you know what that's basically saying? One of these days, it's all going to wind up, and Jesus is going to be the hero it's all going to wind up in him, from him, by him, to him. What Because of him, he's everything. It, you see that verse right here on our pulpit? It says, in all things he, I'm talking about Jesus, might have preeminence. Preeminence means first place. I mean, Jesus Christ. But if you want to get on God's good side, you start bragging on his son. That's what the Lord wants you to do. You brag on his son. That's what the Holy Ghost does. A church talks about the Holy Ghost, 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 the Holy Ghost is messed up. Because the Holy, the real Holy Ghost talks about Jesus. He shall not speak of himself, the Lord said, but he shall glorify me, Jesus said. When a person's filled with the Holy Ghost, you know who they'll brag on? Not the Holy Ghost. They'll brag on Jesus Christ. He'll point you to Jesus Christ. And uh, 
uh, the Holy Ghost is part, the, part of the Godhead, of course. But all glory goes to the Son, brother. The Son of God that paid the price for our sins. Now, interesting word there in verse 10. This is a, verse, a word you should become familiar with. Don't be, be done. Stand your ground a little bit. And that is the word dispensation. Uh, a lot of preachers now, uh, they'll, they'll come and say, are you a dispensationalist? Oh, he's a dispensationalist. And there's preachers, their ministry on YouTube and around the country is preaching against anybody who is what we call dispensationalist. Now, the word dispensation is in the Bible four times. Here, Ephesians 1.10, 1 Corinthians 9.17, where Paul said a dispensation of the gospel is given to me. Ephesians 3, 2, this same book. You have heard of the dispensation of grace Paul said given to me. And Colossians 1, 25, where he said, uh, uh, according to the dispensation of grace. All four times are mentioned by the Apostle Paul. He's the only man in the Bible that God gave that word dispensation to. And here's the definition of it. A dispensation is a period of time in which God deals with men in a certain way. Uh, it's like a dispenser, like a soap dispenser. Put, bring soap in your hand or a towel dispenser. Dispenses out. God dispenses ways of dealing with people and he has certain times to do it. And we rightly divide. And the truth is, I know people think I'm crazy for saying this, but I think they're crazy for not. If you're not a dispensationalist, you're, you're a nut. You, you don't even believe the Bible. It's in there four times. You, you can't just blog it all together and throw it all together in one big... I, I know people like that. We, uh, me and Darren listen to this preacher on radio uh, uh, when we go out on visitation on Saturday. And bless his heart, I, probably the fellow means well and everything, but... Good night, he screwed up as a Chinese fire drill. That's what the old preacher said. Uh, but uh, he, he didn't know he'd going to heaven, hell, or Georgia. <laughs> uh, but, and I don't mean that bad, but he's over here, he's over there, he's over here. He's quoting this verse. He's in the church, he's in Israel, he's in the tribulation. He's in the, and you, it's just a mess. I listen to him every Saturday just to try to figure out, what's he going to say now? He jumps around, and when he gets through, you don't know what he said. It's just a big like a big plate of spaghetti. Our job is to pick it out one noodle at a time, brother, and rightly divide it. That's right. The Bible is like a big old bucket of marbles. The Lord gave me this 40 years ago. I've never heard another preacher say it. God gave it to me, and I've said it for years. People have picked it up. The Bible is like a big bucket of marbles. And in this mar book, bucket of marbles... You've got blue, green, yellow, red, uh, black, white marbles. Now, I'm supposed to go in here and say, green marble, put it right here. Red marble, put it right here. Blue marble, put it right here. Another green one, put it over here. The green. When I get through, I've got a nice little stack of green, red, orange, blue, rightly divided. And that's where the Bible is. You read a verse that says, Huh, don't eat unclean meat. You're not supposed to eat certain kinds of meat. Okay, we know where that goes in this little pile, Old Testament Jews. Now, any creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. If you ask, there it says you can eat anything. We know where that goes, right here in the church age for us. See how I rightly divided it? If you don't, you're just going to have a big mess like that Sabbath. You're just going to have a bunch of contradiction. Uh, who, when, here's the Sabbath day. You put it over here in this little pile. Israel in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, a verse says, let no man judge you of meat or drink or respect the new moon or the Sabbath day. You put it in that little pile. See? Right. Um, uh, offer a sacrifice. If you don't have to offer a sacrifice, uh, you'll die. You can't get sins again. We, put that, we know where to put that. And it ain't here. It ain't now. For by grace you're saved through faith. We know where to put that. There'll be 666, the mark of the beast. We know where to put that. See, watch this. These are the different dispensations. Now, there is such a thing as hyper-dispensation where people just chop it up so much where you don't need to get baptized. 
and that's wrong. But basically, the basic dispensations of the Bible are, number one, innocence. That's Adam and Eve before they sinned. That didn't last too long. That's innocence. They had nothing to worry about. They didn't have to confess their sins. They didn't have to get up and pray every morning or read their Bible. They're in the age of innocence. Now, after they sinned, the second dispensation was conscience. You lived by your conscience. They didn't have a Bible. They had to have a blood sacrifice like Abel to satisfy God. Uh, goes to Romans chapter 2. Talks about that. The third one is human government. And that goes all the way up to the flood. Before the flood, they didn't have animal sacrifices. Before the flood, they didn't have a Bible to read. Before the flood, they had preacher righteousness like Noah, warn them, and it was human government. And then the next one, beginning in Genesis 11, that's the age or dispensation of promise. That's Egypt going into Canaan, wandering in the wilderness. In Genesis 11, the next was there with Abraham. God gave Abraham promise. That's a promise. They still didn't have Bible. Then law, that come with Moses. Then the blood of bulls and goats and so forth and so on. And that brought us up to the church age, which me and you are in right now, by grace through faith. In other words, in other words, Noah did not, you hear me, did not <laughs> jump up on the side of the ark and say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He didn't. He said, well, it's all the same. No, it ain't. He didn't know Jesus was going to die on no cross. Noah preached, get in this boat or you're going to drown like a bunch of rats. That's what he preached. That was his message. Now, what if I got up here Sunday morning and I said, you either get in this church or you're going to drown like a bunch of rats. I'm preaching the Bible. Well, people think he's crazy. We're not in that dispensation. What if, you know why we don't bring animal sacrifices in here on Sunday morning, cut their throat and, and separate the guts and burn them and, and let it take a dove and let one dove go and hold the other back? <laughs> oh, you know why we don't do that? That was in a different dispensation. God dealing with people at a certain, if, if, you, if you're not some kind of dispensationalist, you are confused. You have no idea what you're doing. There's got to be dispensations. There's got to be. There has to be. Some may chop it up a little different than others. I, don't, I wouldn't argue with somebody that disagreed when certain, some time period started. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make a big fuss out of it. But there's got to be some kind of divisions or it contradicts itself. So what you do with the Bible, if you have a verse here that says don't eat meat, and a verse here that says do eat meat, you know what they do? They twist them around to where they both say the same thing. We let them say what they say and put them in the right dispensation. You see the difference? You see the difference? Here it says, don't eat certain kinds of meat. Here it says, you can't eat meat. Well, he just meant the clean ones. See that? See them twist it to try to make them agree with each other? Did you, did you catch that? Nod your head. Here they say, don't eat meat. Here they said, you can't eat meat. Well, the meat he was talking about was the clean animal. Well, duh, we don't know that's all right. There ain't no unclean, unclean animals in the New Testament. Now, if you got any sense, there's animals you won't eat. But you're not forbidden. The truth is, the truth is, God had a reason for telling them them Old Testament dietary laws. The truth is, that was better for you. you better off not to eat a bunch of greasy pork. Uh, I mean, I like ham sandwich. I do. Uh, but... You're probably better off to leave off a lot and and uh, shrimp. You know, you know, you know what a shrimp is? It's a sea roach. It's exactly the same as a roach that it lives in the water. That's what it is, exactly. And that don't bother me one bit, brother. I put the butter on them, so I'm, put them down by the by the tongue. <laughs> but uh, but that, that's basically that's unclean, brother. And that's why you don't eat bats. Unless you're Ozzy Osbourne. That's what started a stupid Wuhan flu. He got it right off the bat. <laughs> but you know what? It's amazing how the Lord just gives you stuff like that from the original Greek. But the truth is, the truth is, you've got to learn how to rightly divide. 
And look, I ain't much, but you are very blessed to be in a church that rightly divides the board of trade. You are very blessed. One thing, brother, we, we do got that book right. I know it all. I don't claim to understand it all. But I do guarantee you that it's right divisions. So if you hear me say something, you say, good night, I've never heard that before. I've never heard that right. Give it time. Check it out for the book. And you might be surprised. You might be surprised what the old book says. Okay, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this good study tonight. Thank you for everybody watching from home online. I pray, God, you take these few simple words and use them for your glory. May your will be done in our life. We love you. Have mercy on us, oh God. Help us, Lord, to do right and bless us as we go ahead in the days ahead. Whatever you do, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn the cameras off here just a second. We'll talk just a second before we go.